good morning, everybody. So, last time we went through the, the interior of the sun and the source of uh, all the energy, so nuclear re reaction in the solar center. And uh, we went up to the first layer in the atmosphere and over the, the whole range we have quite naturally a decrease of temperature, density and pressure. And we'll see that in the next layer things will change. So I had uh, shown already this uh, slide that illustrates how the aspect of the solar atmosphere changed drastically through different layers and this is reflecting change in the physical conditions in those layers. So going to the chromosphere, actually the main change compared to the photosphere that I described last time is the reversal of the temperature gradient. So the temperature that had dropped over, uh, uh, from the center of the sun down to the top of the photosphere reverses, which is contrary to therm thermodynamical laws. Uh, we'll see why. Also note that the uh, uh, density decreases more steeply in the chromosphere by three orders of magnitude. So the base and top of the layer are very different. But uh, how was it discovered? Essentially through what's called flash spectrum, a flash, a flash spectrum taken during the second and third contacts in the total eclipse. When along uh, the lunar limb you see a, a very thin ridge in a bright pink color that's completely different from the uh, silver white corona and that's the origin of the name, the sphere of colors, chromosphere. And actually this bright ridge is associated with emission lines that are mainly in the visible and the ultraviolet and, and this can be seen here in those spectra with the slit crossing the limb of the sun you really have a disappearance of absorbing uh, absorption lines that were characteristics of the photosphere to emission lines once you are above the photosphere. This is a list of uh, the main chromospheric lines which includes H alpha in the deep red, the calcium H and, and K lines that are just beyond the uh, violet limit of visible uh, light and then uh, Lyman alpha uh, which is the main line in the far UV. And uh, so you really have a reversal of the profile of the line and that's why initially many people talk about the reversing layer. This is the vertical profile. Now with the sun on the right, I don't know why they choose to swap <laughs> the dimension. But so this is the photosphere here, the chromosphere. You see the range of density here which is uh, much lower than in the photosphere. It's already close to a good vacuum. But another consequence is that it's a highly transparent medium contrary to the photosphere with an optical depth of 10 to the minus 2 or minus 4. And so the uh, scale height for absorption in spectral line becomes much higher than in the photosphere which it was about 150 kilometers and it jumps to more than 500 kilometers in the chromosphere. So radiation can propagate over much longer distance and this leads to a, a complete change in the uh, uh, state of the plasma. So low density high transparency leads to a source function that's dominated by radiation and with uh, only a weak coupling still brought by electronic con uh, collisions uh, while the two components were in, in full local balance in the photosphere. 
Also, we'll see that the structure of the f chromosphere is highly non-stratified, contrary to the photosphere, we are, uh, with, where a model of that was just plain parallel was already acceptable. And so it means that there is a, an influence of radiation over long distances. So there is no more detailed equilibrium uh, at the local level between uh, collisional and radiative transitions. But overall, still, as part of the radiation is exciting and is uh, being absorbed in the chromosphere, the two remain globally in balance. And so it's still in uh, thermodynamical equilibrium, but non-local. So this, this is the ETNL state. Um, as we, there are free electrons to, due to the higher ionization, you have radio emission being produced in the chromosphere and as a free free uh, transitions. And based on the emissions, you can essentially distinguish the base of the chromosphere with the interface with the photosphere and where you have formation of a continuum, but not in the visible, in the UV and in the far infrared. And then you have a progressive rise to a plateau at 6 or 7,000 Kelvin. And that's where you have the main lines of calcium and H alpha that are formed in that range, as well as millimetric radio emission. And then as you reach the top of the chromosphere, the gradient steepens, and this is where lime and alpha is produced, which is uh, in the far UV, and also centimetric radio waves at the top of the chromosphere. And so by ob observing those different uh, emission lines, you can probe different heights in the solar chromosphere. And we'll see that this gives uh, different views of the morphology of the chromosphere because now we have just seen the vertical uh, structure but actually especially the chromosphere is much more dynamical and heterogen heterogeneous than the photosphere with high contrast in emissions in different zones and uh, the main features that come out here is a filtergram in calcium uh, is the photospheric uh, chromospheric network. Here is a close up, and so you see those dark patches surrounded by bright boundaries. And actually, they are the imprint of the supergranulation pattern that I explained in the photosphere, but that was only visible as a, a, a field of um, uh, horizontal velocities with. Uh, magnetic flux tube being carried by this uh, motion towards the edges of the supergranulation pattern. And so that's where you have magnetic concentration and in the chromosphere you can then see the pattern as the bright ridges around dark cells, about 20,000 cells over the whole sun. And then mainly around active regions, but not only, you have the bright plages and that near the limb corresponds to the faculae, those features we have seen uh, in the photosphere, but there the radiation field was anisotropic because of this evacuation in the intergranular uh, space. But well, we are now in the chromosphere as I mentioned, it's highly transparent. So the radiation field is uh, uh, completely uh, homogeneous. And so you can see those bright features over the whole disk. The main uh, emission line used uh, to observe the chromosphere is H alpha. And in that wavelength, it's really the best wavelength to show uh, another category of features, these are the, those dark filaments that actually look dark 
by absorption because they are a bit dimmer than the quite solar disk. But when they are superimposed on the dark sky at the edge, they look as a bright feature. And as you can see, they extend far above the thickness of the usual chromosphere. We'll come back to prominences a bit later. Of course, all this varies according to the solar cycle that modulates the number, the extent, and the brightness of those uh, bright plages. And this is illustrated here with the H alpha sun, the calcium line, and that's the white light photosphere. And as you can see, while only the larger sunspots can be seen on a global view of the sun, the plages uh, contribute significantly to the brightness enhancement of the sun. And uh, this actually allows to use the sun as a reference to understand magnetic activities of other stars, where you can only record the total flux. And so the chromospheric flux that's, just, uh, that's much more modulated by solar activity is typically the reference index to characterize uh, sun-like activity of other stars. Uh, zooming in to the details, well, the smallest features on the sun are spicules. You see this uh, image showing something like grass. And, and when you see the, those at the limb, this is by a spacecraft in a day, you see those bright jets, size of about 5,000 to 20,000 kilometer, only 500 kilometer width, 20 kilometer per second average ejection speed, and a lifetime of uh, five to 10 minutes. There are about 100,000 of such spicules at any given time on the sun. And uh, actually between those uh, jets, what looks dark is actually, actually very hot material from the corona, which is the uh, next higher layer in the solar atmosphere. But uh, when Summing up the amount of matter ejected in those uh, spicules, you end up with a hundred times the flux necessary to sustain the solar wind, which is the um, expansion of the outer corona and, and also a, a, a loss of matter from the sun. So somehow you can immediately, immediately guess that most of the matter that's ejected actually falls down back on the sun in a ballistic trajectory. And so I will show you a sequence of movies that nicely illustrate this. So this is the driver. So that's the continuum showing the granulation, some spots and a facular area, so those bright edges of uh, granules. And then jumping to the chromosphere, looking in the blue wing of H alpha, you get this. And where you can already see the outward motion of all the spicules. Looking for to higher speeds, it becomes brighter because then you can start to see uh, photospheric emission, but then you can very clearly see the outward motion of plasmine spicules. But then you can go to the red wing and in falling matter. And I swear that I didn't take the same movies as before in reverse. <laughs> And at uh, higher speed, you see the matter raining down. But so definitely, if even a small fraction of what is ejected reaches, managed to escape, there is largely enough to feed the solar wind. And now, this is a nice uh, cartoon that was uh, produced about 10 years ago. It's a pretty crowded but fairly well summarized 
the topology of the chromosphere. So at the bottom you have the photosphere with the granules here, and then here you have a super granule with this outward flow that brings the magnetic field popping up in this uh, inside the super granule towards the edges where you have concentration of well flux tubes actually concentrated at the edges and the granulation actually generate waves that propagate outwards and transform into shock waves due to the steep uh, decreasing density gradient but at the edges, those field lines themselves will be shaken by the motion and actually waves will propagate. But uh, it's only where you have those open field lines that extend vertically outward that you can have those jets and so the spicules you saw in the movies are concentrated here and are represented here. As Ma magnetic pressure starts to dominate when you go outward, the flux tube expand and are fanning out, creating kind of a canopy above the uh, supergranules. And uh, so you have horizontal uh, fibrils, they are called fibrils, that are also uh, characterizing the texture of uh, chromospheric images. But so here you see really how you start from the granulations and narrow flux tubes that emerge there to the structures you see higher up in the chromosphere. As I mentioned, so we, we know that uh, in the, at the level of the photosphere we have this huge injection of convective uh, of kinetic energy by the uh, random convection motion of uh, granules and this is essentially radiated uh, through by light uh, photosphere can radiate a lot of the energy in the form of visible light but in the chromosphere of course with the decreasing density of plasma this uh, path for escape is much more limited and also the, the amount of energy injected at the base is, is, is uh, distributed over a much smaller amount of matter. And this is the essence of what leads to this rise in temperature in the chromosphere. Really you have much less matter to dissipate this amount of energy and so uh, the, the temperature rises because the, the, the energy cannot be efficiently released. Also, as you have seen, the presence of magnetic fields creates uh, vertical structures because you have those field lines ext extending vertically, which leads to the fact that plasma can only diffuse along those field lines. Spicules are an example. Conductivity is also highly anisotropic, and so you start to have structures that can, uh, neighboring structures that can have pretty strong uh, difference in density and temperature, and that's explained the contrast of the features you see in the chromosphere, because uh, transfer conductivity is uh, much more limited, and so this leads to this vertical topology. And then combining that with the energy input, which is essentially the mechanical energy of turbulence. And we have also seen that there are acoustic oscillations that are propagating deep inside the sun, but are actually reflected at the level of the photosphere and so contribute as well to uh, driving actually acoustic, progressive acoustic waves that then propagate outward through the chromosphere and due to the steep density gradient they transform into shock waves that then dissipate this energy in, uh, in the form of uh, either kinetic energy of spicules or uh, heating. But this is mainly occurring in the center of granules that are non-magnetized, but at the edges, the convective turbulence shakes 
the field lines and creates magnetoacoustic waves. And those are very efficient transporting energy vertically and like acoustic waves due to the density gradient transform into shock waves and dissipate uh, their energy as heat. But this is specifically occurring in the chromospheric network. So you have those two regimes and they explain this disparity in brightness uh, in the network and internetwork space. Waves, um, MHG waves, you have plenty of different kinds. The main kinds are a sausage boats. Well, you understand why this is called like that. Torsional and kink waves that are essentially like the string of a guitar, for instance. So oscillating laterally. But so in magnetic field, you have a diversity and often the different kinds are coexisting. So these are the waves that can dissipate. And of course, there are theoretical simulation, numerical models representing, of course, only a small element of the chromosphere. And I will show you a movie that's centered on the flux tube. This is uh, below the photosphere, so that's the sun interior with the convective cells. The white arrows and elements uh, show the velocity field. Then at uh, 2 equals 1, so optical depth of 1, which is the base of the, the atmosphere, which is the black line, uh, you see the flux tube expanding and uh, the curve uh, actually gives you the temperature. So you see the decreasing temperature uh, down to the minimum of temperature and then again uh, heat, uh, hotter elements higher in the chromosphere. And so that's how it looks. And where you see really a transition where the flux tube is confined in narrow space be uh, between granulation cells below the surface, but above, you see that actually plasma follows largely with vertical motions of the elements, and that's equivalent to the spicules. And outside, you see also shock waves that are those colored edge that you see propagating. And so these are the location of dissipation in the chromospheric plasma. So the driving, so the engine here and above the dissipation. Prominences, I mentioned them uh, among the general structures of the chromosphere. Uh, these are large, bright uh, curtains suspended high above the surface, up to 20 to 100,000 kilometers of the above the surface. They correspond to cool gas and more dense gas at about the uh, 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 chromospheric uh, conditions, but suspended high above the chromosphere in the corona. So there are a big uh, mix of uh, cro chromospheric and corona. Temperature and density corresponds to the top of the chromosphere. The thickness is uh, generally much smaller than uh, the vertical extent. Actually, they are often essentially blade-like, you know, and the full extent can be up to one solar radius, so uh, uh, much more than the Earth-Moon distance. Localization and uh, orientation. The orientation, as you can see, well, there is a predominance that's parallel to the equator, but you can have almost any orientation. Actually, they correspond to neutral line, broad neutral line spanning thousands of kilometers, and so uh, and uh, so they ha can have uh, various orientation. Uh, Often they form the base of coronal jets, uh, coronal streamers that we'll see the, that you will probably see in the next course. Uh, 
uh, although some filaments are located inside active region, you see that many of them are not at all related to active regions, and so they uh, can appear almost everywhere on the sun and not only at low latitude. And as they trace broad neutral lines, in this uh, butterfly diagram that I showed where this is the component shown by sunspots, actually you have other components that correspond to weaker fields and are traced by the filaments including, for instance, this migration of uh, residual fields to the pole that I explained when I described the, the di solar dynamo. And actually, some of the high-latitude filaments are tracers of those weak fields migrating to, to the pole. Some of them are actually called polar crone filaments because they are really located near the unipolar regions close to the pole. But how do you produce uh, uh, a prominence? Actually, it's essentially uh, coronal matter, so very hot matter that cools down. It can also sometimes be fed by chromospheric matter being injected higher up. But uh, in order to have a prominence, you need to have a accumulation of this matter and this can only happen if you have kind of a pool where this colder more dense plasma can accumulate and this is possible in various magnetic configuration I took uh, several uh, drawings from uh, magnetic reconstruction where you can see that you can have a dip in an arcade and that's where you can have accumulation of plasma this is an equivalent and uh, simpler representation and this is called mass loading where really the accumulation of mass itself bends the field lines and allow to have dips here or then you can have a plasmoid where you can understand that here you will have the possibility of uh, supporting a plasma but this is only 2D the true aspect is actually that one with a twisted flux rope and where at the bottom of the loops you can have accumulation and this explains why many of the filaments have a coil-like structure but once the plasma starts to cool down you need actually a thermal instability and this is what happens because as you have uh, plasma cooling down and becoming denser electrons recombine with ions allowing transition and so dissipation by radiation which is not possible in the corona and this uh, ability to dissipate amplifies the cooling and so your runaway effect that leads to the f formation of those called clouds well called 10,000 Kelvin well less than 1 million uh, structure of the filaments often well you have the arcade but you have barbs that are often going down to the surface so connecting the surface and often you see twisted shapes indicating the helicity of the magnetic structure in which those uh, clouds are suspended dynamically you can see that they are not static but they are flows flows crossing those structures, often flowing downwards, so gravity plays a role, and if the matter can flow down, it will flow down and go back to the chromosphere. And you can see that filaments can disappear by fragmentation, they get empty suddenly, uh, or by eruptions, when the whole structure in which they are suspended actually uh, detached from the solar surface and so you have two kinds of prominences quiescent ones that can be stable during days or even weeks just staying there with just some flows but no major change and suddenly in less than an hour you can have ejection of a filament and often when you see the, the escaping prominence it's really clearly twisted showing that the structure that's in which it's included 
as uh, LECT, which is actually a driver of such weather. Here is an e another example. That's in a hot coronal lines, but there you see the prominences by absorption, so in silhouette against the bar bright background. And of course, those eruptive filaments are uh, intimately associated with coronal mass coronal mass ejection that will be discussed in the next course, but here I show an example, and that's uh, just a sequence of images taken from that time-lapse movie, showing this bubble, that's the CME, but inside the cavity that's escaping, you see those bright uh, threads of uh, material, and this is the filament that's enclosed in the structure. And so it gives the feeling of having an arcade, that's the expanding bubble, and actually the filament and its flux rope is embedded inside the structure. Those CMEs can happen both in active regions, then in association with eruptions, but just as I explained, filaments are present everywhere on the sun, so you can have CMEs associated with filament ejection occurring uh, completely outside of uh, uh, flares in active regions. Of course, this has been modelized uh, theoretically. Uh, this is a cartoon, but on the right is a true simulation showing this flux rope confined under magnetic arcade. And when this arcade starts to expand by reconnection at the base, the flux rope can es escape. It's like being under a lid, and the lid opens, and the flux rope can escape. And this is shown here, where you have those loops that tie down the flux rope to the surface, but then you may have a reconnection here under the flux rope, and so this breaks the field lines, so the flux rope can then escape, note that the legs of the ropes stay connected to the solar surface, and this will also be an important characteristic of the CMEs, because of course this structure as it expands to outwards uh, evolves according to its connection to the solar surface. I mentioned solar flares, they are the base, the building blocks I would say of solar activity, Solar activity, probably it will be explained more at length in the next courses, but largely it's the, all the phenomena that corresponds to an impulsive release of energy in the solar atmosphere and that are triggered by the evolution and often abrupt tra uh, transformation of uh, magnetic fields at, lo at, the, at the solar surface, if you can take that as a general definition. And they produce uh, jets of uh, high energy particles and of course intense bursts in radiation over the whole spectrum. The chromosphere only includes part of that, but uh, so the main event marking solar activity are solar flares, eruption solar, and the, mechan uh, the underlying mechanism is magnetic reconnection. You will hear more about that later in other course, I guess. But so at the level of chromosphere, here it's how it looks like. This is in Lyman Alpha. This is a set of images taken with our telescope in H Alpha here. And as you can see, they are marked by those brilliant uh, regions that can uh, intensify by a factor of 3 or 10 relative to the quiet uh, chromosphere. When looking more closely, most of those uh, flares are marked by two bright ribbons. Sometimes one is dominant over the other, but mostly you have two bright, uh, more or less linear uh, ridges. And actually, they are marking 
a magnetic neutral line that actually uh, runs in the middle there, it's not visible. And often there is a filament that was sitting there before the flare and escapes and vanish because of the flare. Then you have those two bright uh, ribbons appearing and then often you see ar bright arcades forming and bridging the gap between the two uh, ribbons that seen at the limb actually don't have any vertical extension. So th this is really, uh, those bright patches are, are really at the base of the chromosphere. A movie shows much more than a still image. And here is a flaring region. You see two sunspots, a filament that indicates that you have a neutral line there. And then suddenly you have those two bright ribbons. And as you can see, the filament has vanished. So re magnetic reconnection completely, disruption of ex the ex pre-existing magnetic structure. Two other movies. I like the, the one at the left. It shows only a small fraction, but you see this propagating motion along lines that really indicates that you have uh, something following, you know, the, the foot points of magnetic structures. And at the limb, the ribbons are really just at the surface. All you can see are the post flare loops, as they are called, that expand in the decaying phase of the flare. And here is a picture showing the, the overall principle. Probably you will see again this uh, picture, but the main points are that actually the source of uh, the flare is a reconnection high up, much uh, above the chromosphere. So in the, the corona, and this is the acceleration point of uh, particles, essentially electrons and protons that are uh, ejected at uh, speeds that are relativistic. And part of them will escape, and of course will, for instance, cause uh, space weather effect at the Earth if we are in the target line. But part of them are actually going down, and are thus flowing through the magnetic arcades to the surface, and then strike suddenly the dense layers of the chromosphere, causing a brutal heating in those regions. And these are the bright ribbons seen in H-alpha, calcium, and things like that. And the heating of this plasma will pr pr produce an expansion of the plasma that becomes hotter. And this, that's called uh, chromospheric evaporation, and this plasma can only flow vertically along the field lines, and so will fill those loops. And these are the bright post-flare loops that you have seen in the movie. But as the reconnection involves successively uh, lines that are progressively higher, and so arcades that are pro progressively outside of the arcades that have reformed, you see typically the two bright ribbons, uh, the separation between the ribbons uh, increasing as the flare progresses, indicating this zipping motion of the reconnection point at the top that connects the reconnection point to progressively outer uh, arcades. So it starts with the lower ones and expands progressively with higher and so wider arcades. So that's the picture explaining what you can see. Of course, as uh, the chromospheric emission was the first way, even before the space era, to characterize the strength and also, the, and also determine the location of the flare, uh, this was based on H alpha images, and so this is an index that's based uh, for one part on the area of the fairing region, so essentially the area of the ribbons, 
and the brightness of the ribbons. And this is still in use nowadays, although now we have, of course, X-ray fluxes coming more directly from the coronal part of the uh, flaring region. Dynamics of the uh, associated with the flares. Actually, you have a big bang when there is a flare, thermal expansion, and for the strongest one, and look carefully, the flare is occurring here, but pay attention to what happens north of this active region. You have really the impression of something like a gust of wind shaking the structure and causing some brightening. This is a Moreton wave with a propagation of the speed of about 1,000 km per second. And this is actually the shock component of a structure that actually expands further out in three dimension in the CME. And so the, the coronal mass ejections will have both uh, a magnetic cloud component, but a shock component. And in a way, it's imprint on at the level of the chromosphere. So at the base of the atmosphere is the Moreton wave that's readily detectable in H alpha. But only the strongest flares cause such a, uh, an event. Uh, one of the, re the reason why the chromosphere has a, um, an importance for us is, of course, the effect of the chromospheric radiation on the Earth environment. And so, in this case, I come back to a plot I showed in the, my last talk showing in log uh, scale, vertically, horizontally, so the spectrum of the sun with the, its peak in visible light, infrared on that side, UV on this side, and in red the variability that was very low, 10 at the minus 3 for the photosphere. But then as you uh, can see, when going to shorter wavelengths, which are the ones that are produced in the chromosphere, it's essentially this range, going from the visible to this bright emission line that's Lyman alpha, you see that the variability goes to one or even a factor of 10 in the case of Lyman alpha. So much more than 10 to the minus three in the photosphere. By the way, uh, the outer part of the chromosphere called the transition region is essentially producing this range going up to this line, which is the helium-2 line, which is the uh, brightest line in extreme UV. But you see that the chromosphere is responsible for a, a large part of the variability of solar radiation reaching the Earth. And this part is particularly important because you can see that the intensity is still a, a a considerable fraction of the visible emission. Why that part, you are at 10 to the minus 6 relative to the photospheric intensity. And so, although the variability is high, in terms of absolute amount of radiation, it's a, a tiny amount. But so, it's the near UV part that's most relevant. And there you see, I m mentioned here, just that's where you have the calcium absorption line, magnesium-2, here is Lyman alpha, and helium-2. These are the landmarks, I would say, of the UV spectrum. And based on those dominant lines, you, you can uh, actually uh, build indices, especially as those lines were measured already for a long time, contrary to the rest of the UV spectrum. And so Lyman alpha, calcium, magnesium, helium-1 are standard uh, measure of chromospheric emission. And they are the base of what's called proxies. So statistical relation that allow from just those lines, for instance, to reconstruct the variation of, uh, in the emission of the whole UV spectrum. And this is, of course, important regarding first the ionosphere of the Earth, 
so which is these ionized layers uh, in the upper atmosphere that play a, a very important role on propagation of radio waves and often this is characterized by the uh, measure that's the total electron content along vertical columns but as represented here there are actually three main layers uh, with peak of ionizations at different high altitudes and essentially the E and D regions in the stratosphere and thermosphere that uh, and, and mesosphere sorry that are modulated by UV light from the chromosphere another layer that's also in the, at the level of the stratosphere is of course the ozone layer that's synthesized by solar UV light and at the same time is blocking this radiation with three standard range UV, A, B and C corresponding as you have seen from the spectrum to different layers in the chromosphere. So th there is really a, 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 a quite intimate connections between those different ranges in the UV and different features and layers in the chromosphere. Of course, importance for skin cancer, uh, aging of material, plastic material that are exposed outside. So, a very important region regarding the radiation input in the, to the Earth's atmosphere. And then we come to the very top of the chromosphere, the transition region. That's actually a, an extremely thin region. Look at that. This is the, uh, this is the top of the chromosphere with the Lyman alpha region with a steeper gradient and then it suddenly you have almost a vertical jump in temperature from 20,000 degrees to 1 million, the coronal temperature, and then, then you have the corona here. Uh, the density only drops by f one order of magnitude, so not a big deal, but uh, it's this temperature gradient that characterizes the transition region. Given the high temperatures, you have, of course, uh, emission lines that correspond to uh, more highly ionized uh, atoms. By the way, this steep transition also marks a, a transition between uh, what I would say the, uh, a disk-like sun with a bright disk to a cloud-like sun with bright clouds surrounding an apparently black sphere. So uh, the range of emission as I mentioned is in the far UV beyond the Lyman alpha line with the ionization state with two or two six electrons that are uh, lost and uh, steeply uh, growing temperature and this th this intermediate state between chromosphere and and corona leads to the fact that in in at those layers you have a coexistence of features that are familiar now you see prominences you see the bright plages you see the chromospheric network but at the same time you see dark features here also at the poles that are actually the coronal holes, which are coronal structures. This is all illustrated by a sequence of images, maps built by the Sumer spectrograph. 15,000 degrees, lower transition region, 30,000, and the helium line at 80,000 Kelvin. And you see the progressive evolution from a fairly, well, regular and uniform white sun to things where you see uh, imprints of coronal features. One of the striking, among the striking features are in the transition regions are the super, uh, the macrospicules, as they are called, present only in the open field regions. So you see here the uh, coronal hole that corresponds to open fields like the, that open essentially to infinity, unipolar. And actually you see an extension of the spicules 
of the chromospheric spicules, and you can see that they can reach 20,000 kilometers, so four or five times the height of the highest chromospheric spicules. Quite impressive. But you have also a population of plenty of small brightening or energy injection events. One of them, explosive events, are only detected by Doppler uh, measurements. So with hardly any brightening features, but you see those uh, moustache, I would say, with the, at the same time very strong blue shifted and red shifted wings that actually mimics an exploding thing where you have uh, gas, uh, you know, banging in your face and going away. And that's why they are called like that. Uh, small events duration less than a minute, but 600, up to 600 per second over the whole sun. So that's a large population of small events. Uh, a more moderate version are those blinking things. If you look at any place in those images, you will see that it's blinking. And those bursts are essentially in intensity with a limited Doppler uh, signature a few percent enhancement, duration a bit longer, around 10 minutes, but there are about 40 per second on the whole sun. So again, a large population of tiny infections, and clearly they correspond to local cross-freak evaporation. So what happens in solar flares, but at a much smaller scale, energies that are uh, less than one millionth of the average energy in a solar flare, but all over the sun. And that's important because we have to explain why the corona is hot and the solar wind is present over the whole sphere of the atmosphere, not only where you have big impressive flares. And definitely those small events are uh, the source of this. And to finish, just because of the beauty of those images, I show you a couple of movies made by the Solar Dynamics Observatory. The helium-2 line, and when you see the dynamics, you can see everything here. Filaments seen in silhouettes, some of them at the limb. One here eruptive, other quiescent. You have the bright plages. You have flares. Oops. And uh, then all the blinking population over the whole sun. That's quite different from the smooth photosphere with just a few dark spots. But remember that in terms of uh, energy balance, the density of this is uh, orders of magnitude below the photosphere and so represent only a tiny fraction of, what the, of the energy content of the photosphere. So that's why the photosphere itself, in spite of its stability, is very, very important. And fortunately for us, the photosphere is stable, because imagine uh, variations of a factor of 10 in intensity in white light. <laughs> we wouldn't be there to discuss this. And then, Actually, through those images, one of the key transition is, uh, happens in the ratio between magnetic pressure, as you have uh, well, magnetic fields everywhere in the solar atmosphere, and gas pressure, so the mechanical pressure of gas, which is represented by the plasma, the, the, beta, the beta, uh, coefficient of plasma, ratio between gas pressure and magnetic pressure. And it turns out that you have in the solar atmosphere a, a very abrupt transition between two regimes, where in the photosphere and low, most of the chromosphere, beta is larger than one. And this leads to the confinement of flux tubes that are very narrow and caught in very narrow space in the intergranules and it's frozen in the plasma. So there, the magnetic field is forced to, f to f uh, follow the motion of the gas. And then, uh, with the transition region and the corona that we'll be discussing in the next course, you switch to the, re the inverse regime, where 
the magnetic field suddenly can expand and fill the whole space and it's the plasma then that is channeled by the magnetic field lines and is forced to follow the motions of the magnetic field. And so this leads us for the next step to the solar corona. Thank you for your attention.